Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. This time we're going to be looking back at this channel's original review for A View to a Kill. This has been a much requested one, and if I'm being perfectly honest, I'm kind of apprehensive as to why. This is another one that I don't have that many memories of, and A View to a Kill is a Bond film that I kind of fluctuate on anyway. Over the years, I kind of flip-flop between, oh, it's kind of dull, and then actually it's a bit of a laugh riot, so I have no idea what mood I was in when I made this video. I do remember making an awful lot of very unflattering and not very smart digs about like Roger Moore's age in this one and the fact that he does look older in A View to a Kill than in any of his other Bond films. I do remember specifically doing a very big sort of reaction to uh, him and Grace Jones, their sex scene, and I remember getting a lot of comments about that, being like, we all get old, Calvin, you know, old people do have sex. So we'll see, I'm expecting the cringe factor to be very big on this one, um, you know, we'll see. Hello once again and welcome to another edition of my weekly geriatrics, I mean, uh, Bond, my starting early. Bond. And today we're going to be looking at what I think is quite possibly the weirdest Bond film in the official series, A View to a Kill. I will still believe Why do that. I think it's weird? Well, let's find out. The film begins with the usual gun barrel sequence, and we open on Bond retrieving a microchip from the body of the deceased 003, but Bond is ambushed by some Soviet troops, and we get a ski sequence, which feels really lackluster when compared to previous Bond ski sequences. Bond's skis break off, however, so he ends up improvising. <laughs> really do get into it quite quickly in this. You can hear that my voice, I, I talk a bit more rapidly at this point because the 15 minute <laughs> restriction on these things. Actually saying that, this one's over 15 minutes. I wonder if I had to cut oh, God, this. please take this song off. I will do anything if you revert back to the original score. I'll even say Timothy Dalton is my favorite one. Please, please, please. I wonder if this is like a extended version than what even ended up on YouTube back in the day. Uh... But yeah, it was tough fitting in the uh, the thoughts into 15 minutes back then. Ah, much better. <laughs> After that annoying bit of ear raping, Bond gets ear. to his iceberg submarine where some Miss World is waiting for him. Seriously though, what was with that last song? How did it have any relevance to anything? I thought you'd never get back. Well, there was a heck of a crowd on the feast. Oh my god, what happened to more? It's only been two years since Octopussy. How could one man age so much? <laughs> oh, Commander Bond. Oh dear. Call me James. It's five days to Alaska. Oh. <laughs> Prepare to see me cringe a lot through this review. After the title oh sequence, we get the usual briefing where Q informs Bond M and the Minister of Defense that the microchip retrieved from 003 matches those from Zorin Industries and is designed to withstand an EMP explosion. Turns explosion. out the company's owner is at Ascot, so Bond and the gang, including Moneypenny in a rare field assignment, head to the race course to observe him. It's here that we meet our main villain, Max Zorin, played by, in a weird piece of casting, Christopher Walken, and his henchwoman, Mayday, played by an even weirder casting choice, Grace Jones. We also meet Sir Godfrey Tibbet here, played by Patrick McNeil, a horse trainer and MI6 agent who believes that Zorin's horse has been given drugs in order to win races, despite no evidence appearing on screenings. I should probably point out here that this is the last film in which Lois Maxwell plays Moneypenny, which is a shame as well as something of a relief. Lois Maxwell has a lovely, warm screen presence, so it's nice to see her on screen. However, by this point, she was about 10 years too old to be playing Moneypenny, but saying that if they had retired her for a younger model, our arm is small, but the whole flirting with more thing would have been a bit too cringy, so I guess it's probably for the best they kept Lois Maxwell around for this long. On the subject of aging actors, just look at this. I mean, they're all fine, brilliant actors and that, but they're all in the 50s, for God's sake. It's really time to trade some of these in for younger models. Bond heads to France to meet a contact in the form of private detective Achille Aubergine to discuss how Zorin's horse won. Bollinger, 75. I see you are a connoisseur, Monsieur, Monsieur Bond. Ensuite, Lafitte Rothschild, 59, s'il vous plaît. Another excellent choice. I'm pleased you approve, since you're paying the bill. <laughs> Cheers. Sante, Monsieur Aubergine. Oh, you mean that guy's supposed to be French? Oh, well, he's so not stereotypical. I had no idea. Aubergine tells Bond that Zorin is holding an annual horse sale later this month, then the evening entertainment starts. This whole butterfly bit is still so weird to this day. <laughs> Sorry, does this butterfly thing really pass for entertainment? Who would pay to see this? 
Mayday pops up and kills Aubergine with a poison-tipped butterfly and then parachutes off the Eiffel Tower with Bond giving chase on land. Mayday jumps into a boat with Zorin and speeds away before Bond can catch them. Wow. Bond and Tibbet then head really to Chantilly where that. Zorin's wholesale is going on. Bond poses as a wealthy gadabout with Tibbet as his valet. Mr. St. John Smith? St. John Smythe, my dear. James St. John Smythe. Not quite got the same ring to it as James Bond, has it? Welcome, sir. I'm Jenny Flex. Of course you are. Jenny Flex, eh? <laughs> That's certainly under suggestive eyebrow raise. Bond is shown to his hotel room and we have a couple of amusing moments with Tibbet. Come along, Tibbet. Stop wheezing. <sighs> well, don't stand there panting, Tibbet. Start the unpacking. Here, let me help. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Bond then does some schmoozing around a party meeting Zorin and Mayday, who doesn't seem to recognise him from the Eiffel Tower. Bond also meets Zorin's henchman, Scarpine, some crass American fellow, token mad former Nazi scientist Carl Mortner, and this film's Bond girl, Stacey Sutton, played by Tanya Roberts. Later that night, Bond and Tibbet search the stables and find a secret lab and learn that Zorin is using microchips to release a performance-enhancing drug into his horses when prompted by hidden control. Some bad guys pop up as Bond and Tibbet are discovered. <laughs> Wow, it's like they aged the heavies in this film, just so Roger Moore could feasibly beat them in a fight. <laughs> oh, I do remember this bit, actually. <laughs> it's such an odd scene in the film. I kind of love it now, though, it's so weird. beginning of this review when I said that this was the weirdest Bond film in the official series. Scenes like this are why I think that. Um, anyway, Mayday remembers Bond as the man from the Eiffel Tower and she and Zorin head to his room, but he isn't there. Mayday heads back to her room and finds Bond in, uh, in, in, in bed? Oh, here we go. Now I do remember this bit. Mayday, where have you been? I must have really annoyed I've my housemates at the time filming this in the basement. To take care of me. What is Calvin doing down there? Oh, he's just making one of his Bond videos. <laughs> Obviously. Oh no, 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 they're not gonna, no, 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 please Mayday, no, no, don't do it, no, oh my god, oh no, 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 no! <laughs> Feel violated. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the next day, Tibbet heads out to wash the car. Just going to town to get the car washed. Yeah, she just vanished into thin air. Hmm. The only places that she could conceivably be would be behind the car, or indeed in the car. But you know, I'm not going to check it or anything, no. I'm just going to drive off. <laughs> oh dear. Still love this scene, though. It still terrifies me to this day. Oh, Tibbet, I did love you, but with stupidity like that, is it any wonder you get killed off? Meanwhile, Bond is caught up in a deadly horse race with some really obvious cases of stunt doubling for Roger Moore. It's like they were even trying to hide it at this point. Anyway, Bond is captured and sees Tibbet dead before being knocked out and left to drown inside a Rolls Royce. Of course, though, Bond escapes the vehicle, but Zorin and Mayday stick around a bit to watch, so Bond stays alive underwater by sucking air from the car's tyres. To be fair to Zorin and Mayday, at least they stick around to make sure Bond doesn't come up for air. Thus, they are the smartest Bond villains of all time up to this point. <laughs> so Bond lives, and then we see Zorin giving a brief to a load of businessmen. In true Goldfinger style, one of the men doesn't want to be in on the deal, and thus is ejected and we're shown what is quite possibly the worst dummy to ever appear in a Bond film. I mean, look at it for God's sake! What made the filmmakers think they could possibly get away with putting that on the screen? My God! Wow. What a view to a kill. Sorry, what? What? That makes absolutely no sense. What a view. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. 
Well, I guess they have to get the title of the film in there somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, we're in San Francisco now, where Bond Ooh. meets up with his CIA contact there. The and the oh, Adams. actually, by the way, Maud Adams from The Man with the Golden Gun and Octopus, he has a brief cameo in the background of one of these shots. Happy spotting. Anyway, we see Bond investigating an oil rig. Perpetuating the rumour there. His plans. Bond then bumps into KGB agent Paula Ivanova, played by Fiona Fullerton, who was trying to blow up the oil rig, and the pair have a love scene together in a hot tub. Yeah. I just want to talk, just want to mention briefly about the Maud Adams cameo. Uh, you can go to another video on my channel to, um, I really went in deep with that. Uh, looking at some behind-the-scenes footage and listening to commentaries and interviews and stuff. So um, please do check out that video. I still don't think she is actually in the final film, but certainly when this film, when when this uh, review was made, I think you could only get the films on DVD. It, you know, I don't think they'd come out on Blu-ray yet. Um, so I always thought that that one woman who was in the background was. Maud Adams, but um, it's probably why I said that bit over that shot. Um, but yeah, 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 when you see it in higher def and stuff, I, I don't think it's Maud. And um, yeah, indeed, I don't think she is in the film. Um, anyway, just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to be cringing at this as well. It's Roger Moore naked out with a woman in View to a Kill, so I'm sure there's more cringing reactions coming up. Oh. Fiona yep. tries to steal the tape, but Bond has switched it with a fake one and learns from the tape that Zorin plans to execute a plan to destroy Silicon Valley, therefore taking control of the microchip industry. Bond then poses as a reporter, James Stock, and talks to someone at Town Hall before bumping into Stacy and following her home, fighting off a few baddies and then having dinner with her. Apparently, Bond is rather good at quiche. Anyway, Bond puts Stacy to bed and, bizarrely, doesn't even try it on with her, or even sleep in the same bed with her. Instead, he covers Stacy up with the quilt and sits in a chair guarding her all night, which is really quite sweet and, well, almost paternal. Indeed, their relationship has mostly felt like a father and daughter other than a bit of flirting at the party early on. Maybe Bond really is getting on? Anyway, the pair plan to steal documents about Zorin's plans from City Hall, but Zorin and co. turn up and kill the city official from earlier with Bond's gun before setting the place on fire with Bond and Stacy in the lift. Of course, Bond uses his ingenuity to escape. Don't go away. <laughs> oh, yes, I... Yeah. This has been a recurring gag on the channel throughout the years. <laughs> Oh, I can only take so much of this. Of course, Bond and Stacy escape the town hall and meet with the police below who think that Bond killed the city official. So naturally, Bond hijacks the first vehicle he sees, and as such, we get a fire truck chase around San Francisco with this film's comedy sheriff. <laughs> relief sheriffs going Bond films. I rank this one below Sheriff Pepper, but above the one from Diamonds Are Forever. Bond and Stacy then infiltrate Zorin's mine, discovering his dastardly plan of flooding Silicon Valley using a large bomb underneath the mine. We learn most of this information from Stacy. These lead straight into this section of the San Andreas Fault. You know, Zorin just has to... <laughs> I have a feel like there's an unflattering remark about Tanya Roberts coming up soon. And create a double earthquake. This never yes. sense. Except, except right beneath us is the key geological lock, lock that, that keeps the faults from moving at once. It's a bit of a stretch to take Tanya Roberts seriously as a top geologist, but just you wait until we get to the world is not enough. Oh. The pair are discovered and chased through the mine by Maida, who manages to rip off Stacy's miner's uniform, revealing her dress beneath it. Oh yes, very convenient. Zorin sets some small explosives off, flooding the mine before taking out the mine workers with his gun. Stacy escapes the mine, but Bond and Mayday are washed away. This causes Mayday to have something of a change of character. And I thought that creep loved me! You're, You're the, the only one who double-crossed. Double Bond and Mayday then team up and head to the main chamber, passing various corpses on the way. Jenny! Jenny. Come on, there's nothing you can do for them now. Oh. What? Really? But the heads are above water, aren't you going to at least check that they're not breathing or you know check their pulse i mean they could still be alive no well all right bond and mayday get to the bomb and try to push it out of the mine but the break is stuck so mayday sacrifices herself by staying on the cart with the bomb this is a moment in the film that i particularly love and i like that mayday has a jaws-esque redemption of herself proving hell hath no fury like a woman scorned <laughs> 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 
Zorin's Scarpine and the Nazi Doctor from earlier watch from Zorin's blimp and kidnap Stacy with Bond grabbing hold of a mooring rope dangling below. Zorin tries to kill Bond by flying him into the Golden Gate Bridge, however Bond uses the mooring ropes to tie the blimp to the bridge when Stacy attacks Zorin, causing the blimp to crash into the bridge. What do you mean? Are you crazy? The man just tried to cause a double earthquake to flood an entire valley and kill thousands just so he can have a monopoly on microchips. I think crazy is a bit of an understatement. Mm. Anyway, we get a nice little play on what happened with Kamal and Gabinda in the previous film between Zorin and Scarpine. Go get him. Go. Go! Stacy gets onto the bridge with Zorin following, and we get a really exciting fight sequence. I still love this shot. Brilliant of... and very different track yeah, from John Barry, one of my so favourites, cool. actually. But of course, Bond wins the fight and sends Zorin to his grave. By the way, the little giggle that Walken gives just before he falls. <laughs> it's still a great moment. Just brilliant. God, I love Christopher Walken. Anyway, the Nazi doctor sees this and grabs a stick of dynamite, but Bond cuts the mooring rope, sending the blimp away from the bridge when it explodes, killing the doctor and Scarpine. The film then ends with Bond and Stacy missing, and Q is sent to find them both with his. Um. Uh. uh what, what the. What the heck is that? Cringy. Alright, here we go. Here's the wrap up. <laughs> this hasn't been too bad too, so far, I don't think. Not as inflammatory as I thought it would be. What a weird film. I mean, it feels kind of run of the mill, kind of like how Octopus in VR eyes only have been, but there's so much in it that just makes it so weird. It really sticks out. I mean, the film has Christopher Walken and Grace Jones as villains, how can it get weirder than that? Okay, so yeah, apparently David Bowie was up for the Walken role originally, and that would have been a hell of a lot weirder, but still, Christopher Walken! Though as odd as these castings may be, I can't help but absolutely love them, with Zorin and Mayday being amongst my favourite Bond villains. Mm -hmm. Wow, I sure do have a lot of favourites, don't I? Hmm. Tanya Roberts is good as Stacy, but I guess she doesn't really have that much to do. She's a very stereotypical Bond girl, spending most of her time in peril and needing to be rescued, but that's fine, you know, whatever. The true shining light of the cast, though, is Patrick McNee, who has a wonderful chemistry with Roger Moore, and it's a real shame that his character gets killed off so early in the movie. Mm. The film has plenty of action sequences, and the majority are all right and, you know, fun, exciting, whatever, but they really could have done with putting more effort into hiding Roger Moore's stunt doubles. The score, by large, is one of my favourite John Barry scores, and I absolutely love the Duran Duran theme, but what the fuck is up with that California Girls song that plays over the pre credit sequence? It's not appropriate in the slightest! As much as I do really, really like and enjoy A View to a Kill, it does have a very tired feeling to it, like not a whole lot of effort went into it. It feels like the producers went into making it with the attitude of, let's make another Bond film, rather than let's make the best Bond film ever. And as much as I love and adore Roger Moore, he was 57 when this film was released, and he was clearly too old to keep on playing Bond. Most of the girls he beds in the film look half his age, and it all makes for some very cringy moments. I wish they hadn't have had Bond shag Stacy at the end, and rather had Moore's tenure as Bond end with him maybe realising he's too old for that kind of thing now. I guess kind of like what they did with Cary Grant in his last film, Walk Don't Run. So I guess I would have kind of liked it if they'd gone down a bit of a retirement reference. angle with Roger Moore in this film. Of course this would have meant the next one would have to have been a total reboot of the series, but that is effectively more or less what we get with Timothy Dalton being cast in the role, and so, in a couple of weeks this time, we should be looking at Dalton's first James Bond film, The Living Daylights. In a couple of weeks? I wonder what I was doing that meant I couldn't keep up with the weekly schedule. The swearing really caught me off guard at the end, and I was like, oh wait, yeah, <laughs> I did swear a lot more in videos back then. Um, but that one was quite strangely very unsweary, I think, for the most part. It was interesting. Okay, so that was nowhere near as provocative or inflammatory as I thought it was going to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the many a comments made about Moore's age in the film and, and whatnot, but otherwise I didn't think it was... Like, terribly 
like I say, provocative. And I don't know if I especially disagree with many of the comments that were in that one. I think I'm probably at a, a, a point with the view to a kill that I was then, where I kind of like, I, I, I find the fun in it. Um, it's the weirdest Bond film by some margin. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was fairly more positive than I thought it was going to be. And I didn't think it was too bad <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, my own personal cringe factor. Um, I kind of thought, oh, okay, that one, uh, you know, of all the ones that I've watched, I, I don't think it holds up all that bad, to be perfectly honest. Do let me know your own thoughts, of course, in the comment section below. And also below, you can subscribe to this channel and click the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video uploads, including more in this series, where I've got to be looking back at the rest of my original uh, Bond movie reviews. So please do stay tuned for more of those. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.